Welcome into another episode of Bill's Pod Squad. Maddie Glab and Bill's owner and president, Kim Pagula, here as your host back on Kim's couch for a second week in a row. Cozy couch for sure as the snow is falling in Buffalo. As we're taping this podcast, the weather hasn't changed much no. from Monday night. Maybe not as windy as it was, but the snow is It falling. is December. It is December. I mean, we... what. We expect it at this time of the year. It's about time. Uh, Kim, moving on from Monday night, a tough loss here. I know a lot of people wanted it to be a win. We know the weather had a factor in that, but can't be the reason why the Bills came away with a loss. So it's about what you can do in this short week and and moving on and and moving upwards. Yeah, it it is a short week, and this is the NFL. So, you know, we talked about how, how much football is just ultimate reality TV because all the storylines that are out there across not just our club, but across all the clubs, the ups and downs from week to week. Um, it, it's something, you know, we're now we're getting into kind of those, what we call meaningful games mm-hmm. um, later on in the season, but this is, this is what happens. Like there's nothing given to you. There's nothing given to you. There's nothing expected. Um, and, you know, Monday's game was just a reminder of that. Yeah. These losses hurt. I know the team is bummed, but Hey, your eyes have got to be on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this Sunday. It's it's a quick move on mindset. Learn learn from what you can and implement that into the game plan, h- how you see fit for this upcoming matchup. But we are going to move on here with our guest this week. We've got Tracy Wolfson on with us. She's a sideline reporter for CBS, has covered uh, college football, the NFL, uh, college basketball, the NBA has has been a part of Final Fours, Super Bowls, NBA playoffs. I mean, you name it, she's been there. And she has a pretty cool story about how she got into the business and really kind of clawed her way into the business, into the, the role that she's in now. And seeing so many more women, like you said, on the sidelines. Yeah, and it's cool. In the, in the broadcast, um, you know, you know we've, we've had a lot of different networks, you know, doing the games. Um, so it's, it's always nice to kind of catch up with them and see, hey, you know, how, how did you get here? Because yeah. um, a lot of them took completely different Yeah, paths. everybody's story is different yeah. from what they majored in, how they got there, the connections that they made along the way. And, and her story is pretty cool. She's a big Michigan fan. She's a Michigan grad. So she gets into what she thinks of their season and also what it's like to call a game with some pros in Jim Nance and Tony Romo. So here's Tracy. Tracy, thanks for being on Bill's Pod Squad with us this week. We love having fellow women in the industry yeah. and also uh, people who know the team's best, people who get to cover the NFL on a daily basis. You know, we we get the Bills all the time, but it's nice to have other people on who who get the Bills and other teams a lot. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. I, it's always fun to sit down, talk football. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me on, and I'm excited to see the bills. And of course I'm excited that it is in Tampa in some nice weather. <laughs> you you missed the doozy, Tracy. Uh, I was going to say the winds. Um, I don't I, know that I've ever been to a game where it's been the, those gusts of winds for that long. I can't um, even imagine. We were talking before, um, you know, what that was like and to be out there and, Oh my, have to, having to adjust like that. It was crazy from a fan point of view, but it made it really entertaining, I have to say. Well, I will tell you, I pretended I was a sideline reporter and I stayed <laughs> out there the whole time. Not pregame, so, not, not during the whole game. Out there the whole no, game no, I'm, I'm talking about the pregame. Someone was like, oh, well, you know, you don't have to go down. Like the weather is so bad. I'm like, nope, nope. I, I've got to represent. And I, you know, if the guys can warm up out there and play the whole game, this I can do is stand on the sidelines for, for warm up the whole time. So I, 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 I love it. I love the passion. I love the, of course, I love seeing that. Yeah. Those guys are in like, they're in short sleeves, you know, sometimes they come out with no shirts or like, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah, yeah. It's like, who, who's going to be the macho man today that, that warms up without a shirt on or with cut off sleeves. Yeah. We had our fair share of those guys, but <laughs> I'm sure they do it for a good reason. I could never do that. So I, I commend them, but we are very happy uh, to be in Florida weather this weekend and not have to worry about wind or snow or any of that. And it's actually snowing as we are talking right now in Buffalo. Um, <laughs> but you're, you're covering the Bills Bucks game, of course. Uh, you're going to be the sideline reporter for that game. So what storylines are you following right now as we approach Sunday afternoon? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just how the Bills rebound after that frustrating, I think is the right word, loss. Um, as we saw some, from some press conferences and whether it's from the coach or your players, um, you know, there was definite frustration. And I think, you know, how you kind of quickly put that behind you and refocus on a really difficult team and have to get on the road and go into their place against no other than the GOAT. Um, I think is, you know, but sometimes that can, you know, that can prove to be a good thing, right? You kind of just like flush it away and you know, you're focusing and you get up for this challenge because everyone gets up for a challenge against Tom Brady. So I think that's, you know, how, you know, the bills are able to recover, um, would be something that stands out to me. I'd like to see more physicality. I'm wondering how they work through that this week. They talked a lot about the physicality on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Um, and I saw that in the Steelers. The Steelers came off their loss to the Bengals and were you know, asking, where's this physicality of the Steelers? Where are they? And then they came out, pads were popping. They you know, did some different things in, in practice and were able to come out. And we saw they had a huge game and a huge win against the Ravens. So I think that's important. I think those are the two big things that kind of stand out. Of course, there's the X's and O's and what they can do to try and win. But when you talk storylines, um, and I just, I like any matchup against Tom Brady and Josh Allen. I think like, I'm sure he has, you know, stories of facing him and just being able to, you know, watch him. All these young players, it's so funny when you sit in meetings with them and they're just like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm playing Tom Brady. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I used to watch him or I played him in Madden or whatever it might be. So I love, I love that. Um, and there's, you know, good storylines between the coaches that you can uncover too and their relationships. So I think that'll be, you know, I think there's a lot of different angles that we can take when we talk about these two teams facing each other who don't normally face each other and certainly because they're in different conferences. So I'm um, looking forward to it. Yeah. And that, that's what I love about football because, you know, as much as we, we say it all the time, but the reality is it's it's a week by week game. And I know coaches say, you know, you got to earn it. I mean, nothing's given. It's, it's hard to win, you know, on Sundays or whatever, Mondays, Thursdays. But it's so true in games like we just had. And, and not only our team, but all the teams across the league, there's been some ups and downs. But, but that's the great part about football. That's why we all have a job, right? <laughs> Of course. And it has been a crazy season. It's like just when you think and then all of a sudden the opposite happens. And so you're right. Expect the unexpected. Right. Don't go in and assume this is how it's going to be on paper because we've seen it. But that is what we love. It's what keeps us coming back. It's why the ratings are so great. It's why we have all the fans that we do in the NFL. And, and you're right. It makes our job, you know, the best there is, certainly. And in terms of just not knowing what any Sunday or any Thursday or any Monday night is going to bring, and, and you alluded to the crazy season that we've had, uh, what are some storylines that just have shocked you about the NFL this year or, or a, a certain team that you didn't expect would be doing something that they're doing right now? What's, what's at the top of your list? I think there's a bunch of them. I think you can go to, you know, Kyler Murray in Arizona, who basically like, you know, ran through the beginning of this season and no one was paying attention to them. And they're like, oh, they're the last undefeated team, right? And they're like out in the desert. No one's paying. We don't even get to see them. I won't see them once this whole entire season. But it is pretty incredible what they're doing out there. I know they dealt with some injuries the last few weeks, but still um, just a tremendous job. I think the AFC North is just wide open. And it's crazy. You're, you know, will the Cleveland Browns win it again and make it to the playoffs? Is it going to be the Steelers? What's happening to them? Is this Ben's last year? You have the Ravens. What's going on with Lamar Jackson? And, oh my God, they have 20 guys on IR right now. How do they recover? And then you have Joe Burrow returning from the ACL and the Bengals. And can he lead them back? That division is just incredible. And then you can go to the AFC East and, you know, what, what the Patriots have done. I think everyone wrote them off last year. And then they said, how are they going to be able to quickly turn it around? I mean, Bill Belichick, uh, you know, we can always say he deserves coach of the year. I mean, you know, he deserves coach of the year right now. I mean, what he's been able to do, um, and I know you're coming off a bad loss, but it's pretty incredible. It really is when you see him be able to adjust to a game plan like that. 
And um, so I think the AFC East is still really wide open. You can go to the AFC West in Kansas City and you're like, oh, they're going to come back out. They're going to make this run. And they had their struggles. And you have the Raiders, everything that they've gone through and been able to somewhat keep it together. Um, I mean, you can just pinpoint every, it, this season has been incredible. And I don't think there is one team. Right. I mean, I think right now, you know, the NFC, you look Green Bay is up there. You're like, OK, you know, Anne Ranch playing really great, went through the whole COVID situation and all the controversy there. So this has certainly been an entertaining NFL season, I would say. I mean, who needs reality TV I, when you have the NFL this season? It is reality TV. Right? <laughs> that is true. And you are so um, and you are a Michigan grad. Go blue. You can see, I think it's this way behind me. Yes. Yeah. Huge so, mission, Brad. so not to, you know, not to, you know, say what age you were, were you able to see Tom Brady at all? So he did overlap with me for about a year. Um, we had the whole Drew Henson error who basically was playing in place of him. And there was all that controversy. So I never had a chance to really meet Tom or be around him and all the stuff I did for at Michigan to try and get into this business was actually more through CBS and ABC and the networks as opposed to working with the athletic department or any of the teams. So I never got really close with any of those players. I actually, I got close with a lot of the basketball players, including Jawan Howard, but so I never did, but we have that connection. Every time he walks into a meeting room, you know, we hug it out. I'm sure this week because of the big win by Michigan and heading to the college football playoff, we'll definitely have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And I get a chance to actually go because it's a Friday. So I'm going to try and sneak it in and then head out to my game the Saturday after, which will be kind of cool. Well, my husband is a Penn Stater and okay. so being in the Big Ten yeah. uh, and, and he tells the story like when when uh, Penn State was playing Michigan and Tom Brady was there. He's like, I can't believe we just got beaten by this this quarterback <laughs> named Tom Brady. Like he, who, like, is he? Like, who the heck is this guy? Right. Like and just like unbelievable that that we had to play someone like Tom. Uh, well, not we because I didn't go there, but uh, <laughs> when he was there at the game. So, yeah, he, he likes to tell that that story. Yeah, all the time. No, he, he wasn't this big name. Yeah. Drew Henson was the guy, you know, at that time for me. So it was all of a sudden, who is this guy? Right. Well, then, there, you know, talk about storylines, you know, even in, in college and you talk about um, Michigan and all the coaching changes that have happened and and some Jeez. of the uh, the contracts that they're getting and, and just how it's a world. Yeah, it's it's um, yeah, certainly there's even more storylines, not just at the NFL. And here, you know, he is with an NFL coach that went back to college and. And the success that um, Harbaugh is having this year is. is yeah, amazing. I think I saw a stat that said he's the first college or first coach to win a playoff game and then head to the college football playoff or, or something like that, uh, that hasn't done both of those things. So, yeah, you know, I am impressed with the job that he did. And there was a lot of, you know, as coaches in the NFL know, there was a lot of heat surrounding him when you lose and you can't win the big ones. And he wasn't able to do that. And uh, credit to Ward Manuel, their athletic director, he, you know, kept him, kept him on, you know, he wound up taking a pay cut, but they made changes. And that's what we were talking about, you know, with head coaches, you know, to surround yourself by the right people. And that's what he did. He altered his staff. He brought in some really young, smart blood athletes Actually, like from the NFL specifically, Mike McDonald, their defensive coordinator, who's having an incredible season, was from the Ravens, from his brother, John Harbaugh. So, you know, John Harbaugh, Mike McDonald wasn't going to wind up being the defensive coordinator there because Wink, Mc, you know, Martindale is there and he's established. So John's like, OK, go over and work with Jim. And here he is, has turned this defense around. So it is all about surrounding yourself by good people. And he did a really good job changing the culture this year of uh, being like, Let's just go and have fun. Like, let's show that. And you saw it. I think it was in the Wisconsin game. Wisconsin plays jump around and they all jump around. You had the whole Michigan team jumping around on the sidelines during that. And we all, everyone, every Michigan fan was like, this is a different team this year. And it's paid off. That is amazing. How do you like their chances against Georgia? I, I think they have really, a really good chance. I think Georgia was a little exposed against Alabama. They came in with this number one defense, um, and Alabama was able to take advantage of it. We have a pretty good defense, too, and our quarterback, Knockwood, doesn't make mistakes, and I think that's huge. 
And Georgia's schedule, comparatively to the Big Ten schedule that Michigan has to go through, was a little suspect also. I spent 10 years covering the SEC. So I understand the differences in those divisions. Sometimes when you get a down year in the SEC East, you know, you automatically can get into that, you know, the SEC championship. And so I think uh, I think it's just wait and see. But I think we have a good chance. I look forward to it. Yeah, well, I know that, you know, going to Michigan, you know, kind of give us how was your career path have been to where you are today with with uh, CVS? Um, I think a lot of our listeners like to know, you know, they see you on the sideline. He's like, how did, how did I you get, get that there? job? How did I get that job? Right. So we know you started out in Michigan, but but kind of take us to kind of what your career path has been. Yeah. So unlike I think many, I actually wanted to do this since I was about seven or eight years old. I was watching the NBA inside stuff with Willow Bay and Ahmad Rashad, and I am dating myself right now. So I remember watching Willow Bay and being like, you know what, that's what I want to do. I want to talk sports for the rest of my life. And I was narrowing schools down and my parents were like, I'd really like you to stay in New York. I grew up in New York and, and go to a state school. And I'm like, but I really want to go to Michigan. I wanted to be surrounded by big time sports and uh, made a deal with them. I would pay my own way and to and from, and I'd work all four years. And that was kind of like our deal and got to Michigan. And they actually basically closed the journalism program when I was there my sophomore year. So I had no classes to take to prepare me for what I wanted to do. So I really had to find internships and ways to get involved. And I did through the communications department, I got an internship at HBO Sports and I made a lot of connections there. And they would go, they were freelancers and they'd work for ABC and CBS. And they're like, hey, when I come and do a game, come help us out, be a runner. And we, we still do that to this day. I have so many runners from schools working for us game day. And I worked with Vern Lundquist on basketball and all these you know, incredible talented people. I got to see the business from that side. I did that for about a year, made a lot more connections. As we know, that's an important part of our business. And as uh, soon as I graduated, I applied to work for CBS as a researcher because the problem is I didn't have a tape. I had nothing to show. I wanted to be on the air, but I had no tape because I couldn't do anything at Michigan to, to create one. And so I was a researcher for a year at CBS. And here's a little story for you. I went in and when you're at CBS as a researcher, your next job is what they call a BA. It's just the next step in the ladder. And you're, you're, you work in the trucks and you create graphics. And that's just kind of at one day you want to be a producer or director. That's the path. So I went in to apply for that job just because that's all I could do at that point. And the producer at the time says to me, I know you know sports and I know you love sports, but not like the guys do. And I'm like, oh my God, did he just say that? Like did it actually just come out of his mouth? And I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. This is not what I want to do anyway. I certainly didn't want to be working for him. I wasn't going to get the job. And I'm like, I'm out. So I left and I was actually offered a position as an agent. So I worked as an agent for a year and I saw the other side of the business, you know, how to put a tape together, how you should present yourself, what your voice should sound like, how to get a job. And I did that for a year. And then I was like, okay, I'm getting all these people jobs and I'm not on the air yet. <laughs> like what's happening? Then I was a producer for a year working for the legendary Bob Wolf at a really small station. And I put together a fake tape. Every time the reporter would go out and do a story, I went with him and I did the story on the side. And then I edited it together and I made a tape of nothing that ever aired. <laughs> and I took a class in Long Island somewhere and you got to do, sit on the anchor desk and do some stuff, put that on my tape. I just made this whole tape. I sent it all across the country and I got one job in Trenton, New Jersey for this mom and pop shop. I was their only sports reporter hired and I, that's how I got my feet wet. And that was my first opportunity to get on the air. And about a year and a half later, I really honed my skills there. Nothing was ever live though. It was all Monday through Friday, which was crazy to think. You know, you taped everything, you edited everything. I got so much experience and then, not, but nothing was live. And after about a year there, I had an agent actually reach out to me and said, you know, it's also being in the right place at the right time, right? So everyone was kind of looking for a woman to be alongside at their departments and at the, on their news desks. And so I got, a, I got a job for MSG Network and I had never been live. My first live game was for ESPN. 
I mean, it's crazy to think. No big deal. Yeah. It was, and by the way, I was terrible. Terrible, because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no experience doing that. I had experience being out in the field, you know, doing taped interviews, cutting it, making features and packages. And so I remember my first game was Louisville, Kentucky for um, ESPN. It was college football. And I'm like, here I am, like with a microphone. I'm like screaming into the microphone. They're like, you know, that's why you have a microphone. You don't need to scream. <laughs> I remember them telling me that. So that's kind of after a year at ESPN, CBS was looking for a number two reporter. And because of the connections I had had and because I had once worked there and they knew me, helped me get a little bit of a leg up. And that's how I wound up at CBS. 18 years later, I've been with them. I, I do have some young women who would, you know, kind of complain to me that they feel like they have to work more, work harder than, you know, than their male counterparts. But I always tell them, you know, just you, the example that you gave, like, embrace that because that actually makes you better. Like yeah. being, feeling whether or not, it, you know, you feel like you have to do more or do, but all that, like, it Prepare comes to. back. Yeah, it comes it comes back to you at some point. You just have to be patient enough, a little bit of luck, opportunity, but all that hard work is never wasted. No, you have to create your opportunity and you have to create your luck. And, you know, I think a lot of people in our business will say that and you say in the right place of the right time, but you have to put yourself in that right place. This doesn't seem like that sometimes. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do understand that. And, you know, I think mine was a very, you know, unconventional route. I would not you know, give anything back. I loved everything I did. And I think I was a better reporter for it because I was able to see so many different sides of the business. But I do tell young reporters, you know, get as much experience in college as you can if you want to be on the air. And, and the competition obviously is a lot, you know, more intense now than it ever was then. So I think, although it was hard to obviously break through because you're a woman, but I think there's the opportunities now, um, you know, now more and more want to do it. So you really have to get that experience as, you know, often and as young as possible. And really, like you said, just you have to really work hard for it. Yeah, there's as many opportunities now today because of people like you who paved the way. And now so many colleges and universities have their own version of a um, broadcast network or a sports department where they are putting out uh, content like we do here with the Buffalo Bills. I mean, it, five years ago, not every single team had a their own team reporter. And now you look around and almost every other team in the NFL has someone like me who gets to report on what happens inside and outside of the building. And so there's just so many more jobs now that you can apply for or look to. So I think it's awesome um, just with how we've seen this industry go grow, especially because of social media and, and how big Twitter is and how big, you know, what the web is now today. And, and now you're seeing teams put stuff on TikTok and Snapchat. It's like, what's going to be next here? But it just ends up creating more jobs um, and opportunities for people who want to be on camera, off camera. So I just think that's such a cool part of it as well. But uh, as you're leading up to this game, I mean, can you share what your week looks like? Because a week for a sideline reporter is, is so different than a week for many other people in this industry. So how do you prepare? What does your week look like leading up to your travel day? Yeah, so we, I joke, it's always like Groundhog Day. You know, you come home on like Sunday or Monday and you unpack and repack that wheelie bag. You know, it's kind of that same routine. Um, Monday is basically like dump day. I dump like everything I just went through. So actually I'm sitting in, in, it's not really an office. I have like no office in my house and I just need to like, because I have three boys and three kids, I'm like always just trying to keep myself in one room away from everyone. But anyway, I like get rid of all my old notes and, and these blue cards are like sacred to me. Everyone laughs. This is what I travel with all the time. And I get rid of all my old stuff. That's Steelers and, and Ravens over there. And then I start focusing on like bills and bucks. And, you know, that's usually like Monday into Tuesday. And during the week when, you know, especially when my kids are at school, that's when I really focus on, um, on trying to, you know, get all the information. And then I start, who do I want to talk to? What extra players or coaches that we're not going to talk to in our meetings? What kind of storylines do I want to follow up on? Um, and then as we get towards Friday, usually that's our travel day. That's certainly, you know, COVID has changed things a lot. We don't meet teams in person right now because it's a it's a big risk for both the teams and for us. And so we're talking a lot on Zoom. So we'll talk to a, a, a coach, player, coordinators um, and quarterback 
on Zoom on Friday and then on Saturday, and we'll either fly in on Friday or Saturday morning, depending. Um, you know, and the nice thing is we get to all, usually when it was a normal, you know, season without COVID, we would get in on a Friday, we'd go to practice, we'd meet in person, and then we'd have like a, a real, a team dinner, which is always fun. I mean, it's hard to be away from our families. So the camaraderie that you get and get yourself out of your room is great. And then on Saturday, we, we would meet again with the home, with the away team flying in. And then we have a production meeting. And I'm sure it's very similar to what you do, where you have a production meeting of, hey, how, and. And, and even with you, Kim, you you all have a pre-meeting, right? How are we going to attack this game? How are you going to attack the day? And so we kind of go through what are our storylines? What's our open going to be? Um, what graphics? What big features do we want to do? How are we going to support it all? And then... Um, and then we get ready for the game is, you know, whether it's a one o'clock or a 425, you know, once you kick off, the only thing I script for a game is my open. That's the only thing I need to like know what I'm doing. I want it to be perfect all the time. Of course, you need to make sure it makes sense with what the guys are talking about. What aren't they talking about that I can add? And once it kicks off, it's read and react. You know, I have like tons of these little cards with different stories about players and ideas and things I want to get in and stuff we got out of the meeting. But you know how these games go. I mean, you could throw everything out the window and maybe I get one thing in or maybe I don't and everything's coming from the field. And that's what I love the best. I absolutely love being the eyes and the ears on the field. And people ask me a lot. They say, do you want to get into the booth one day? Do you want to call games? I just love being in the action down there. And it's almost like an investigative reporter. It's, you know, you're trying to find out the storylines and why is the offensive line not playing well? And what's the interaction between them? And what's the communication? And is there someone frustrated? What's the injury happening and how it's affecting this team? And I just love trying to find those things from the field itself. So if I don't get any one of my pre-made stories in and I can get everything from the field, I'm great. Or you, you weave it in. So Jim and Tony will start talking about you know, Lamar Jackson, and all of a sudden I'll be, oh, I spoke to Lamar Jackson this week and he said this, and that's exactly why this is what he needs to do against cover zero. And I can just add, and that's what I love, but it's a lot of prep, but it's also a lot of patience and knowing that sometimes you're going to get it all in. And sometimes you're not, you're not, I tell a lot of young reporters don't get frustrated. Sometimes you'll be on 10 times and sometimes you'll be on once. It's not about how much airtime you get. People are watching the game to watch the game. And yeah, sure, it's very nice. My dad wants to see me on TV <laughs> all the time. Why aren't they showing you more? But for me, it's really just how you can be involved and help the broadcast. And you have to go in with that mindset. And I'll tell you, I'd say 75% of the stuff I prepare actually doesn't get on. And some of it, I pass directly to the booth or to the truck. And that's the best stuff you can give them because it's not going to get on, but at least they know about it. So I can just say, oh, he just hobbled off and they replaced him by blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, this, it seems like, and I'll, I'll say, Tony, open me to Tony. I'll be like, Tony, this is what they're discussing in the huddle right now. I'm not allowed to report that, but he can say, oh, that makes sense. I can see why. Give me a replay. I want to show what just happened here. So whatever I can do to help the booth, is another part of the job that no one sees because it doesn't get on the air, but it's a critical part of the job. I, I would have a hard time on the sidelines because <laughs> it, it was, it, there's so much going on, like, like you said, Tracy, but I couldn't keep my emotions in check. <laughs> you know, like I, I would, I would like, you wouldn't want to go to the camera with me on the sideline because you could totally tell by my, my, my body and, and my face, like, what I'm happy or not happy or upset about or whatever. So you're invested in a team. When I covered Michigan in the final four, it's very similar. It's very, <laughs> I'm like, kind of like this, like underneath the, the, the desk, I'm like, Oh my God. But you have to try and like, you know, be unbiased. Yeah. That's difficult. Yeah. Of course you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, that's why I would not be a good reporter, especially. You would be great life. if you weren't covering the bills. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's go. why even up in the, up where I watch the game with my husband, their GM, that's why I sit in the back row so that no one can see me. <laughs> like, you get to do your thing. Yes, yes. I can do what I want and, and no one has to watch. Uh, watch what are you like in the, in the booth though? Are you like one of those like this? Are you nervous? Are you walking around? Are you pacing? Uh, yeah. All of it. I would be the same. Uh, all of it. Yeah. Um, all of it. Like you said, because I, I think one of the things that uh, we talked about, you know, reality, ultimate reality TV, 
you, I can't control anything that happens on the field. You know, like, you know, you're, I know legally we're not allowed to text coaches on the field and all that, but yeah. like, but even just in a broader aspect, nothing that not like I can't control one aspect of what's happening uh, during the game. And that is what I think the stress and the anxiety is not that I know how to do it any better. I would have called a different player or anything like that. I think that's, it's just the, the fact that you prepare and you do all these things, but again, it's no control show football. League. Mm -hmm. You can't, things happen. You're yeah. in real time. Like anything can happen. And the wind and, is uh, howling. Yes. You can't, you can't falling. control it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's where I, I struggle with. <laughs> I Are you superstitious at all? Because like I was watching the Michigan game with my husband a few weeks back, I had the weekend off because we did the Thursday game and there was the Ohio state game. And we all were like, someone moved out of their seat and we're oh. like, Get back in there. You have oh, to. No. You can't move. Are you superstitious oh, like that? Yes, very, very much so. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. We, we, we a lot of superstitions. Yes. Um, they don't make sense, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes. Whether it's, I mean, who's in the room, what I'm eating, yeah. what I'm wearing, it just, yeah, all of that. That's awesome. That's great. You get to work with some pretty cool guys. I mean, Jim Nance and, and Tony Romo, you, you mentioned Tony uh, in your last answer. I mean, what is it like to get to work alongside people like that and alongside a player who played in the NFL for so long? I'm sure as you you know, envision your career, whether you are younger or even when you're at CBS, I don't know if you ever thought one day I'm going to work with Tony Romo. <laughs> All right. Well, here's a little nugget for you guys. This is going to be our hundredth game together. The three of us. Wow. So that's a special one for us because you know, it's, you want that consistency and it, it's been a really fun few years together and to get to that hundred. So this is a big one for us. Um, and we're going to try and celebrate a little bit, but um, Tony's been great. He is, uh, he brings a lot of energy. He's like a big kid. And you asked me like, if I ever thought that, well, to be honest, we were at the final four and he came a bunch of times. And I think it was, it might've been in Dallas or Houston. It was in Texas and he came and he's, he was friendly with Jim before and he's friendly with a bunch of us. And we had him at our final four dinner and our, our, you know, bosses asked him to speak and give a breakdown of the final four. And he got up there and like you were in awe after he was done breaking down the final four. Now this is basketball. This isn't even golf, which he's really good at, right? I mean, he's good at basketball, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. this is college basketball. And he got up there and we're like, oh my God, he's going to be a great broadcaster. <laughs> like, we knew right then and there. And I think our bosses saw it right then and there also, which ultimately led to, to him being hired. And so he brings great energy, as you know, from the, you know, listening to him. Um, he's a lot of fun to hang with. He loves like doing team dinners and, and going out. And that's huge for our business because you talk a lot. Like when you're, you know, when you guys are, you know, having dinner, you discuss a lot more stuff. You're in the same room. You're able to come up with different ideas. Um, and it certainly benefits us. So he loves that aspect of it. And he's so good not only in the offensive side of the ball, which I'm, you know, of course is impressive, but, and you expect, but the defensive side of the ball, he's so impressive. And it's because he spent a lot of time in defensive meetings because he's, he has kind of like this amazing brain. He can see things and process it really quickly. And that's what he was able to do as a player. So he kind of got bored on the offensive side of the ball. And he's like, let me just go into some defensive meetings and learn it. So it's fun to sit down with him especially with these coaches and, and see them pick their brains and, you know, get different ideas and say, well, why do you do this? And why do you do that? And he's really learning along the way. And then at the same time, he's passing on information and advice to young quarterbacks, whether it's Josh Allen or whether it's Justin Herbert or Lamar Jackson and, and giving advice to them. And I love seeing it because they're the ones who are like, oh my God, Tony Romo's in the room and he's giving me advice. I, you know, I grew up watching this guy and there's a lot of them who were grew up Dallas Cowboy fans. So, you know, it's really fun to watch his different dynamic. And um, I learn from him all the time. I ask him questions. I learn the game better because of him. And then Jim Nance is an old pro. I mean, right. he is, you know, <laughs> man of the people. He's incredibly generous and kind and fun to be around and so good at what he does. Anything you guys know, you can put him anywhere and he can 
he can call cornhole if he had to. Yeah. And it would be, you know, it would be perfect. It would be perfection. Um, and I get to work with Jim in basketball too. So we've worked for a long time together and have an, a tremendous relationship. And so 100 games together, we'll be able to celebrate it this Sunday. Looking forward to it. I, I'm very lucky to be part of this crew. I, I mean, I totally think that what you guys do is so important for the for the game of um, well, football, but you know, any, any sports, anyone in your position, because you re, you guys really connect the game to the fan. You know, not everyone can go to again or, or to a game and, and be there in person. And I miss like when I'm actually at the game, I miss the commentary. I miss like watching it on TV because you learn so much mm -hmm. and it, it creates like, you know, you guys just said 100, 100 um, shows that you guys done together. But you guys almost it's like you become part of that whole football family. Yeah. Like we like, you know, especially the three of you, like I've seen you guys so many times watching games like, you know, you're kind of a part of part of the, the bigger family. So what you guys do is so important, I, I think, to to the game, to the connection with the fans. Um, so I'm, I'm just I'm thrilled that that you'll be able to do our game in uh, in Tampa. Yeah, in Tampa. Yeah, <laughs> First right. <and> sunny. <laughs> yes, exactly. I know. And I, I thank you for that because we don't think of it that way. And, and that's, you know, really complimentary and, and very kind of you to say that. And um, I think that's ultimately your goal is for, you know, fans to enjoy listening and watching and, and learning. And, you know, I think I always do say to myself, what do they want to hear? You know, what are they interested in? What do they want to know? And that's why, that's how I go to pick a lot of my stories. I'm like, I don't, this is not something that I think, you know, most people are interested in. This is a big storyline right now. We got to talk about it. And so, um, you know, it, it is, you know, also really nice to be part of one conference in a way. You know, it's weird because, you know, the CBS is AFC and, you know, and, and Fox is usually NFC. And there is that camaraderie. I mean, I walk around, you know, a Steelers game and it's Tracy, Tracy, like they know me. I've been doing so many of the games. There are numbers that will come out this weekend. I'm sure I think we did like 23 New England games together, the, the three of us already. I mean, the amount of Kansas City games we've done together and you do become part of, you know, the fan base. And that's what I love. I, I do like crossover. It's great to see other teams and have different experiences, but really being part of you know, this AFC and for the fans to get to know you as like a person and a broadcaster and your team, it is special. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for the time. Thanks for uh, taking 20 minutes out of your day. We know you've got a game to prep for and stuff to do. And this is your focus time, as you said. So uh, we appreciate the conversation and, and getting to hear about how you prep for a game and, and just your, your path to where you've made it right now. And the fact that you guys are celebrating 100 games. So cool and happy that the Bills get to be a part of it. Yes. Well, and thank you guys. And I will. I look forward to seeing you in person, Tracy. I will look for you on the sidelines to make sure that we connect. So, um, and you don't have to bundle up. You don't have to worry know, about it. <laughs> the wind isn't going to blow us away. We're going to be all. Hopefully, some sun will be shining. Seventy-eight degrees, perfect. That's right. Well, we don't have an advantage, though. I guess maybe sometimes it's not an advantage. Well, this sometimes the other teams. I don't remember yeah. in, T in Tampa because we haven't played them in Tampa in so long. Mm -hmm. If you know, some teams have like. Put the visiting team where the sun is in their yeah, eyes that's all the true, time. That's so, true. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yes. See what the one of the teams I covered did bring in their own air conditioned benches. Wow, it was for, it was early on in the season. Yeah, I thought that was pretty impressive. But um, no, we're gonna be good. I can't wait to see you guys there. And thanks for having me on. I really appreciate thank, it. Thank you, Tracy. You look forward to to Sunday's game. Thank you. So Tracy seems like she's excited to host us in some sunny Tampa Bay weather, which I think we can all be excited about too after Monday night's cold, windy game. But, you know, I also feel like the home games that we've gotten this year as of late, it's been windy, it's been rainy, it's been, and not to make excuses or, or be bummed about it because we're in Buffalo and it is what it is and it is what we expect, but it'll be nice to be in some sunny weather here. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, we, we talk about um, just 
the, the sun just kind of lifts your spirits up and, and knowing, you know, and knowing that it's, it is a, so, yeah, it's, a, it's a short week. So, you know, you can't, you, you have to kind of look, look towards Sunday because you've got a job to do, you know, I don't think anyone, including our coaches or our players just in there, you know, uh, crying uh, now. Yeah. I mean, they're focused on what's going on next week. Still a lot of football left to be played. Um, a lot that we can answer back to on mm -hmm. this game. Um, I'm obviously not going to lie. We're walking into Super Bowl. Um, champions and and Tom Brady, you know, just uh, one of the best in, in that position. But that has got to be so much fun. Um, you know, if you think about Josh Allen, um, how many games has he watched Tom Brady, right? Yeah. Like even like when he was a little kid, you know, for to be able to be in a game. And I know he's played Tom before, but just to to kind of just that's what you want to be. You want to be um up against the best you want to play with the best you want to you know and I, I think at any athlete this is an awesome opportunity for our team but for josh to be on the same field with someone so respected um like tom brady as much yeah. as i don't like the guy um, <laughs> in terms of in terms of yes in terms of uh of what he's, he did with uh yeah. with the patriots mm -hmm. when he was here and in, in our division uh, yeah. nothing personal just you know but <laughs> um but at the same time it's it's got to be uh, an amazing opportunity for josh and and the rest of the team to go up against um Super Bowl champions. I think when Tom Brady moved on to the Buccaneers, I believe it was Tredavious White or some player in the secondary. I always get all those guys mixed up when it comes to quotes and everything because they always have so many good things to say. But I believe it was Tredavious when he was asked about Tom Brady moving on to the Bucs and what it meant um, with him being not a part of the Patriots and, and now the Bills paying the playing the Patriots twice a year, of course, because they're in the same division. And he was asked, you know, is, is it going to be any easier? Are you happy that he's gone? And Trey was like, yeah, Tom Brady is gone. He's such a good player. And maybe some years it won't be as, as big of a competition because he's not the quarterback. This was before they drafted Mac Jones, but he said, but at the same time, I want good competition yeah. every single game. And it's also a bummer that we don't get to see him twice a year because he is such a great quarterback and playing against guys like that only make us better. And I don't want, I don't want to beat the Patriots and people to say, Oh, it's because Tom Brady is not a part of the team anymore. He's like, I enjoyed that competition. I really enjoyed playing against a quarterback as good as him. And I'm kind of bummed that he's out of our com out of our division now. I, well, let's not go that far. <laughs> <laughs> let's not go, go that far. But I, yeah, I, I totally agree with yeah. that. You know, that's how athletes are. They strive on, on competition. And it, again, it does, it pushes you to be better. So just, just like losses do as well. So Yep, we'll see how it all shapes up, comes together on Sunday afternoon, a nice 425 kick, and then the Bills are going to be back, back at here. home. Got three more home games left, uh, two cool. more away games, and then the end of the regular the season, season is near. It, it has gone by so fast. So we will see you guys next week. Yep, thanks for tuning right. in. Check you out next week, another episode of Bills Pod Squad. Make sure you stay tuned.